Welcome to my channel. Um, in case you're new here, my name is Grace McLean. I'm a writer. I live in London. And so far on this channel, I have just sung lots of cover songs and done some random things and not really talked much about writing. But I thought actually um, I can talk about writing and it might help some people because it seems that lots of people want to write a novel these days. I'm not saying I recommend writing a novel. Um, but if you want to do it, I think I can help you do it a bit. <laughs> um, and to that end, I have composed... Sorry, a small proviso. All of these 23 points are just generalizations. Of course, there's always exceptions to the rule. The first idea is to be moved. This is not to say I condone mawkish or sentimental or mushy writing. I don't like that at all. In fact, a lot of my favourite writers are very, I'd say, kind of cold, clinical, cerebral. Like um, Kafka, Jane Kutzea, Tom McCarthy. However, when I say be moved, I mean be really excited. That could be about an idea. Um, so that there's an emotion behind your work. Because emotion is just energy in motion. And writing needs a hell of a lot of energy. So I would recommend finding something you're really passionate about. Or I guess you could be angry about. Or sad about. But in any case, there needs to be a certain fuel for the writing and emotion. In my view, is that fuel. Number two. Now, similarly to the previous point, I feel if an event is significant to you, and that's all it has to be, it doesn't have to be significant on a historical or political level, but just something that you feel is potent and important, then that feeling will be conveyed to the reader. Three, take inspiration from a work of art. This could be a painting, a piece of music, a poem, a good example of a novel which does this is Tracy Chevalier's Girl with a Pearl Earring. I wrote a short story which was inspired by a piece of classical music because I decided to imagine how it would be if someone had never heard music before and then they suddenly encountered this piece of music. Choose a famous person. example of this is Hilary Mantel's trilogy focused around the life of Thomas Cromwell. Um, but it doesn't have to be a real historical person, it could be a person from mythology. For example, the Song of Achilles won the Bailey's Prize, I think, a few years back. I didn't read it, well, I read a few pages of it, but my point being, write about a personage that appeals to you. Another good example of this is A Thousand Acres, a very good novel by Jane Smiley which takes the story of King Lear and transposes it to America in the, I think, kind of 80s. So you've got Lear, Goneril, Reagan, Cordelia, and their husbands. Five, imitate a writer you revere. Now, I did this a lot for quite a few years before I began writing my novels, because I couldn't find my voice if such a thing existed. And so, by apprenticing myself to my favourite writers, I remember at the time, and mostly still are, they were Hemingway, Steinbeck, Virginia Woolf, D.H. Lawrence, uh, Tom, Thomas Mann, J.M. Kutzea, Marilyn Robinson, Cormac McCarthy. Actually, I, didn't, I hadn't heard of Cormac McCarthy then, can you believe it? But I copied their style as closely as I could, almost to the point where it was a sort of pastiche and quite funny in places. But what this did was free up my writing hand, so to speak. Um, so by following really closely in my master's footsteps and taking on their voice, I found my own voice. And there was an energy to the writing. And I was inspired by my masters. I guess it's similar to the way um, Painters in the olden days used to apprentice themselves to the old masters and study them and copy them implicitly for sometimes many years. And 
liners might seem to hinder your own creativity, but in fact, lays a solid foundation for the cultivation and then the application of writing skills. Uh, learned in the manner of speaking at the knees of your chosen teachers because you, you don't really need to go to a creative writing school. You can learn as much as humanly possible just by reading, imbibing, absorbing and imitating the work of your favourite writers. Six, pen a letter. Now, a good example of this uh, is Gilead by Marilyn Robinson, which takes the form of a long letter. Um, it's almost like a prayer in places, and we're not really sure if it's written or spoken. I think it's written, but it goes on for such a long time, we, re we kind of forget that, that someone is writing this. The impression that's constant, though, is of a voice speaking very intimately to another voice. This voice is John Ames, who's an ageing pastor or clergyman, feels he's done a very long life to live, and he's writing to his infant son, um, the little boy, he's about three or four, I think, and it's one of the most moving and beautiful moments. Now, why I say pen and letter is because it's a good way to free up your voice as a writer, if you can't find something instantly relatable, intimate and often very effective about the first person voice of a letter. So perhaps start to write a semi-personal letter to, it could be a real person or it could be an imaginary person, it could be someone you love, someone you trust, someone you hate, a stranger, um, perhaps even to a young, young child, and, and just see what comes of that. Number seven, explore a dreamscape. We can have our strangest, most powerful and most atmospheric experiences while we sleep. If we wake from a particularly potent dream, it might be worth making a note of it in as much detail as possible, trying to conjure that uncanny knowing, otherworldly presence, and any emotion that we might have experienced in the dream. Two of my favourite novelists who I would describe as geniuses write in a very dreamlike manner, Franz Kafka and W.G. Seabart. Number eight, go to Earth. By which I mean don't go into hiding, although that's not a bad idea as well. <laughs> and lots of writers do have a very solitary nature. And writing itself kind of, you need to be alone a lot to a certain extent to do it. By go to earth, I mean immerse yourself in nature, if nature inspires you. It does inspire me a heck of a lot, but if cities are your thing, then immerse yourself in that. Or if the Barbican or Brutalist architecture is your thing, then immerse yourself in that. Basically, surround yourself by something that makes you feel alive. In nature, I don't necessarily feel happy, but I just feel more things. So I can feel kind of like this um, atavistic kind of terror. Um, I can also feel very sexual, I can also feel intense sadness. Um, basically, being around people and buildings and traffic deadens me. But nature awakens everything in me. I, I get more hungry uh, when I'm in the natural world. Um, I've written here, also, nature lets you be yourself more. It opens the possibility of being more truthful as opposed to constantly being around other people and having their energy, thoughts and pressure around you. And I think that's why I like writing so much at night when I was writing my novels. The Rainbow, possibly the most beautiful novel I've ever read, betrays D.H. Lawrence's intense relationship and the inspiration he drew from the natural world. And actually all his work does, and not just the natural world in terms of trees, landscape, rivers, but animals. Number nine, let words come. By which I mean stop trying. Trying is antithetical to good writing as it is so many other things in life. The first passage of The Land of Decoration, the first page, came to me when I stopped trying to write what I planned and write what I felt I should be writing one day. And I think I just let myself sort of enter a playful headspace, a light headspace. 
And these words just came. It, they turned out to be the first words of the Bible in the beginning. Not surprising because of my upbringing. But after that, more and more words came pretty much out of the blue. Um, and those words left me with a character, a world, albeit a room, but a um, very intense drama can happen within a small space like a room. It left me with two characters actually, Judith and God, and I was really excited when I thought that God might be a character in my book, um, because I hadn't come across a novel which dramatised God before. And it also gave me the metaphor that is threaded throughout the land of decoration, um, whereby something stands in place of something else, and which I feel is a central tenet of Christianity uh, as well. I even had strong inklings of what might happen at the end of the novel from that passage. Um, I wanted it to be very kind of symmetrical and almost simple like a fairy story. And so I knew if Judith, this child, I didn't know she was called Judith then, if this child, I decided it was a child, was creating this model world, then what might happen to the model world and the child at the end of the novel? So relax, let go and let God. I'm joking, but what I mean is just loosen the reins and let your mind be be fallow and, and just have a playful, light attitude and just see what words come. 10. Read a fairy tale. This might not be a dramatisation of a whole fairy tale, although that could work very well, but you could just take a detail or a minor character and make a whole story out of that. A few recent novels have done this. Uh, one was called Gingerbread by Robert Dinsdale and it was actually a very dark, macabre, grisly tale. Eleven, return to childhood. I've written here, if the past is a different country, childhood is a different world. Things smell more strongly, colours are more vivid, and memories can be irrationally unsettling or inexplicably ecstatic. In short, there's lots of raw, untapped writing material. Remember, our child selves are practically strangers to us now. We all know that imagination is quite a large component of any memory. So when we go back in time quite a long way and remember our child self, there's a fair amount of imagination already happening there. So we're half the way, I would, you could argue, towards creating a character by re-invoking our child self. Twelve, unravel a mystery. This could be a missing person, real or imagined. It could be a gap between buildings, a noise you can't place, or something you find fascinating. For instance, the other day I saw a program about octopi. Writing often provides answers to questions that are implicitly asked. This is obviously the case in, say, essay writing, where the writer explicitly asks a question. But I feel novels can also do the same thing, and all good writing has a spirit of inquiry about it. I'm sure a lot of writers would testify to the fact that they have discovered things they didn't know simply through the process of writing. But what you do need to do, but what you do need to be is curious about something, intensely curious. Um, it could be argued that writing is just looking very, very closely at something, or trying to be very honest about something. And both of those things are linked to being insatiably curious. So choose something that fascinates you or you just can't fathom and start writing in an inquiring fashion about it. Um, I've chosen Moby Dick as an example here because the white whale in that story symbolises all that's unknowable and unpindownable. Um, this whale eludes capture for decades. Um, it seems to have like a human intelligence. And the very colour being white, it's like 
no color and all colors. Um, it's like a tabula rasa, a white, a white sheet, blank for every person's interpretation. Uh, a lacuna, a gap, an aporia, uh, the perfect cipher, a symbol of nothing, God's name, unpronounceable. I'm getting carried away and this is all well known and well documented. But what I'm saying is there's something fascinating, um, uncanny and just unfathomable at the heart of the novel which keeps us reading on and here we go. 13. Pour over photographs. I like seeing the concentration of histories and characters in old photographs. As a moment snatched from the passage of time, a photograph can contain all the dynamics and information of whole lives condensed and arrested. As long as we don't know too much about a photograph, it can lay out the bones of whole stories and the outlines of a multitude of characters and their relationships. When I was writing this, I thought of Thomas Hardy's novels, which generally take their titles from the names of his characters, like Jewel the Obscure, or Tess of the Dermavilles, or the Mayor of Casterbridge. And I imagine old photos may offer rich pickings for a writer. 14. Observe a Stranger. Once I had the idea for a very, um, con I won't say that. Once I had the idea for a novel uh, through observing a woman and a young boy on a tube train in London, a momentary glance or exchange between two people or um, a small action a stranger makes can stimulate our interpretive faculties and our imagination. An example of a simple glance that conveys multitudes in a novel is when Isabel Archer comes into a room in Henry James' Portrait of a Lady and witnesses a look that passes between her husband um, Gilbert Osmond and Madame Merle. And this one look completely unhinges Isabel because it reveals to her their treachery, their betrayal of her, and it's, it, it's her undoing. So it's like the whole of the novel hinges on that moment, which I find really exciting. And when we observe strangers, we're only ever seeing glimpses and snatches of their lives, but they can be so revealing. 15. Enter a building. Take inspiration from a building or a locale. Examples of novels which do this are The Secret Garden, although that's also a garden and a house, uh, Wuthering Heights, Rebecca, um, Nathaniel Hawthorne's House of the Seven Gables, Bleak House. Houses can be so atmospheric. Oh, and Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House, of course. Several famous novels are placed in a certain building, their whole narrative coloured and shaped by the character of the locale. 16. Get lost in a place. Some of my favourite novels are atmospheric and intensely place-centred, uh, like White Sagasso Sea, for instance. I really loved it when a writer evoked a place in a very potent way. For instance, when E.B. White describes the barn in Charlotte's Web, or Laura Ingalls Wilder describes the prairie in Little House on the Prairie. Other examples of novels which do this brilliantly are The Shipping News, Ulysses, and dare I say it, even Winnie the Pooh, because I don't think anyone could refute the fact that the Hundred Acre Wood is one of the most atmospheric places in fiction. That was apparently based on Ashdown Forest in East Sussex. 17. Study an object. Studying an object is a bit like the activity that spiritual teachers and mystics undertake. And perhaps not incidentally, the writer I'm thinking of in connection with this, Marilyn Robinson, her writing has a very metaphysical, what I would say spiritual quality to it. And apparently she began housekeeping, her first novel, and included a novel included in so many lists of 100 best novels ever. 
And that novel apparently began her describing in intense detail a pocket watch. Now this description, which I think was just a few paragraphs probably of this pocket watch, led to the unearthing of a metaphor of apparently solid things passing into transience and into non-being. It then led to several more passages about other objects and not just objects but settings like for instance a room or a garden always with the same metaphor and the same vein of inquiry at the heart of them and then she stitched the passages together and ultimately housekeeping was the result. So by starting small and focusing very intently on perhaps an inanimate object, a wealth of creativity can result. Personally, I think you can go very deep by staying with the small and concentrating your focus on a limited field. I've discussed that in one other video, I think, where I talk about miniaturization. This is because the small concentrates and distills. I feel there's just less room for error in studying the small and also less room for the self to come in and cloud the writing. The self is kind of the enemy of good writing. We want to just be a lens, just be an eye, not I, the self, uh, uh, this eye, and not have the film of self between things. I've written here the ultimate example of the object expanding to become a novel and a world is perhaps the famous Madeleine at the beginning of Marcel Proust's Swan's Way. 18. Get away from it all. By which I mean holidays and travels can be rich pickings for beginning a novel. This is for many reasons. When you're away, your sense of self is a little bit shaken up uh, and you see with fresh and curious eyes. The world around you is new and yourself is new. There are some masterpieces written in this vein, for instance, Thomas Mann's Death in Venice and all of W.G. Seabell's writings are essentially travel notebooks and uh, Kazuo Ishiguro's Remains of the Day takes place over, I think it's a week long road trip that Stevens, the ageing butler of Darlington Hall, takes to visit an old friend. And although the past is delved into in great detail, so that sometimes we almost forget Stevens is on this holiday, the fact remains that he is, and the novelty of his new surroundings throw his sense of self into quiet crisis and by means of this crisis he reevaluates himself and his whole life to devastating effect. Also on holiday, as I'm sure everyone knows, um, things can get really stressful, things tend to go wrong, we can get lost, we lose belongings um, and this is fertile ground for writing. <clears throat> 19. Adopt a time frame. Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway takes place over the course of a day. James Joyce's Dublin, sorry, James Joyce's Ulysses takes place over the course of a day as well. Uh, the remains of the days we've just mentioned is, I think, four or five days or a week. And Mezzanine, I can't remember the author right now, but that novel takes place over the course of a couple of hours on a lunch break. I was really disappointed when I discovered this novel, though it's brilliant because I wanted to write a novel which just lasted an hour, not in real time when you read it, but um, in narrative time, but it's already been done. <laughs> the reason why giving yourself a time frame can help stimulate the writing process is because not only is it less daunting to have a limited time to describe, but like studying an object, it keeps our focus concentrated and therefore stronger. We can't afford to dramatise or describe the unnecessary. Rather like adopting the constraint of a sonnet forces a poet to adhere to certain conditions that both erase and impose a pattern. 20. Experiment with unlikely combinations. 
by which I mean mix and match characters and situations. This idea came to me when I was thinking of one of my favourite novels, which is Lord of the Flies by William Golding. Um, it's deeply disturbing and it's hard to put down. But if you take the two components, a desert island and a group, group of schoolboys, neither seems that interesting, really. A desert island could be deadly boring and a group of schoolboys, well, it's so mundane, we see them every day. But if you juxtapose the two, mayhem ensues. So it might be worth thinking about some unlikely clearings that might stimulate ideas for stories. I think the reason why unlikely combinations work is because environ and character are both seen more clearly by virtue of their contrast and brought more vividly to life. 20 21. Take inspiration from a philosopher. If you're into philosophy, you could maybe think about dramatising some of the tenets of your favourite philosophers. This has been done in a novel called Wittgenstein's Mistress by David Markson to great effect, which explores the inadequacy of language, faulty memory and radical isolation. More recently it's been done by Lars Eyer, who has written a novel called Wittgenstein Jr. 22. Empty your mind. I don't have much experience with meditation, but I know it's very powerful because I did it twice. I don't mean two separate in instances, I mean two lots of three months. And meditation can shake up your sense of self, your sense of reality and your sense of time, all of which can be invaluable when writing. What's more, although this didn't happen to me, apparently meditation can give rise to revelations, knowings and new understandings. Although the challenge then would be to convert back into words that which arose in wordlessness or wordless silence. But that in itself may be a great creative constraint like the Japanese form of haiku. And the last idea, although it's not really an idea because you can't make it happen, is to suffer. By which I mean don't walk around like a tortured artist and think of yourself that way but if real suffering comes into your life don't resist it. The reason I say this is because, firstly, the most obvious reason is that a novel can't exist without some conflict because it's just like a, a piece of drama or a play. And if you've experienced a fair amount of suffering and conflict in your own life, you've got a lot more material to draw upon. But that aside, um, suffering deepens you. It gives your voice more resonance. I don't mean your literal physical voice. I mean your voice if you're an artist or a writer. Um, suffering is like a funnel or a pressure cooker. It concentrates what comes out of you and makes it more potent. At least this is what I think. It I may as well just read this because um, I, can't, I can't think while looking into a camera. Suffering creates little cracks and fissures in the self which you need to get rid of in order to write well. I mean you need to get rid of the self in order to write well. And through those cracks, not only the light gets in, as Leonard Cohen memorably said, but creativity can pour out. Suffering lends you compassion and understanding of others and makes you more honest. I don't mean literally honest, if you let it. And perhaps being a good writer is only ever about being honest. So if a period of hardship comes along, consider the possibility that it may open up more than you at first think possible, both inside you and without. And those are my 23 ideas on how to start writing a novel. Thank you for watching this video. I hope someone found this helpful and best of luck.
luck writing your novel.